All right, thank you, everyone, actually, here. Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that anyway. I'm afraid I won't be audible if I don't. Um, I'll kind of back my chair up a little bit. So, ah, thank you so much for being here. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, sorry for the, uh, the, brief, uh, the brief delay, uh, technical difficulties that were quickly, quickly dealt with, or well, sort of quickly dealt with. Um, great, and thanks to Mathieu for, uh, for arranging the work, in progress, uh, the work in progress this semester. This is perfectly timed for me, as you'll see. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the project that this, uh, that this actually comes from. Um, but also, this is, this is great for me, in early December, I, I'm going to go give this same talk uh, at uh, Bielefeld in Germany. If you're watching on the stream from Bielefeld, stop the stream. Stop, you can just see it in real life later. Don't, don't watch this. It'll be better, because I'm going to change it. Uh, so, it's a great time for this. I really do have a, a work in progress that I'm, that I'm super happy to get, uh, to get more, more feedback uh, about. I should also mention the changed titles, so uh, explanations became theories. I'll talk a little bit about that, and that's actually something that I would love, especially because I know I have a, uh, a room full of explanation nerds uh, uh, here, which is awesome. Uh, I would love to kind of pick, pick some brains about, about uh, well, briefly, explanatory virtues versus theoretical virtues, which is kind of an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting whatever. Some overlap, some not overlap, the same concept, but also not the same concept. So I, I want to I talk about that later. Um, but yes, what this is, what this is coming from, oh, I've got to make sure my mouse cursor over here so I can actually like, do slides. Um, what this is coming out of, it's coming out of a book, out of a future book project. So I'm, I'm going to be writing up over the next about six months a book on the idea of breadth as an explanatory slash theoretical virtue in the life sciences. And so this is a piece of that, a piece of that project. It's one of, it's the first time I'm talking through one of the case studies, really. It's one of the case studies that I, that I wanted to, uh, to get the chance to present. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you some basic structure. I'm going to introduce a little bit about the theoretical virtues in general. I'll talk a little bit about the idea of uh, scope which is sort of my launching point for talking about breadth because it's the closest that people get uh, in the kind of classic literature on uh, explanation or, or theoretical virtues to talking about, about breadth. Um, I'm going to kind of make trouble for scope in the context of the life sciences uh, by, by, by offering some, some kind of hopefully interesting examples. I'm going to hand wave past a bunch of context and kind of give you my, give you what I think is my current version of my final answer. Um, and then I want to work through a case study, which is a fight that's been going on about the role of natural history. Uh, so late 20th, but also 21st uh, century context. There's been a really interesting argument going on in the biology literature. Uh, Long story short, what I want to claim is that it's a breadth fight. That's what they're fighting about. That's the theoretical virtue that they're arguing about. Um, so, first thing we need to do is talk about what, what theoretical virtues even are. Um, I don't want to overdo it uh, and spend too much time on this. I like this fairly straightforward, fairly simple definition that comes out of Sam Schindler's uh, new book, or new-ish book now, 2018. Um, the pandemic makes 2018 seem like a new publication, like a fresh. Um, great book. Uh, if you haven't read it, uh, Theoretical Virtues in, in Science, it's a lovely, lovely discussion of, uh, in his case, an argument for realism coming out of discussion of the theoretical virtues. Um, but I, I like this simplistic definition. It's just, it's just the kinds of things about a theory that scientists value and that guide choice between, uh, between theories. It's characteristics that would encourage you to pick one theory over another, right? And everybody reads uh, Kuhn's classic list of the big five, accuracy, consistency, scope, simplicity, and fruitfulness or fertility. Uh, big argument, especially a little bit at the end of structure, but especially at the end of essential tension, where he talks about why he thinks these should be understood as values and not as some kind of purely epistemic criteria. 
Um, there are more uh, Schindler Schindler canvases, a couple of others. I think this is a, you know this is this is worthwhile, right? Um, testability is one that everybody talks about. Non ad hocness is one that everybody talks about. You can also lean to uh, you know get a little farther afield and talk about symmetry. You can talk about visualizability. Um, it's actually gets a lot of airtime in, in Hank Derek's book on scientific understanding. Um, and conservativeness, not, not going too far from uh, uh, the, current, the current state of affairs. Um, you know, cool, this is, this is kind of what we have in mind. I'm trying to stay kind of light in terms of over committing myself to stuff about what a theoretical virtue is or even what other ones might be because really what I want to do is just to give myself a way to talk about breadth. I just really want to talk about scope. Because um, I think there's something really interesting here, namely, scope is in every one of these lists and nobody theorizes about what it really is very much. So I want to dig out what theorizing there is about it and, 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 and kind of go from there. Um, so when Kuhn talks about it, um, he's mostly worried, it seems, about the problem of old evidence. So. A theory's consequences should extend far beyond the particular observations, laws, or sub-theories it was initially designed to explain, right? So this kind of has a, a novel prediction, old evidence, kind of classic mid-20th century philosophy of science uh, uh, flavor to it. Um, interesting, but, but uh, well, let, let, let's keep going, not, not super trenchant. Um, in Schindler's book, so here's the, here's the cover if you don't know it. Yeah, awesome, awesome book. Um, scope, it said the word scope doesn't show up in the index. Um, when he talks about scope at all, he actually cashes it out as unifying power. So he says, look, a theory has unifying power or broad scope when, that's my emphasis, when it unifies phenomena which were previously considered uh, distinct. So this is a pretty common way to think to the extent that anybody has really theorized about scope, this is a pretty common way to do it, right? People tend to talk about unifying power. I'll, I'll borrow from Philip Kitcher's analysis of Newtonian mechanics when he, in his theory of explanation, uh, he leans very heavily on the idea that part of what made Newtonian mechanics exceptional was this idea that it could have this real unifying power about it. Uh, it could bring together all of these different kinds of phenomena. Um, so, just a oh, brief aside, I don't want to sign up for Kitcher's theory of explanation as unification, I, but I, I'm just picking up on his analysis of, of, of Newtonian mechanics. Um, long quote, I know, I'm sorry, but I think worth it about what he says about Newtonian mechanics. So Newton's achievements it inspired some of his successors to undertake an ambitious program, which I call dynamic corpuscularianism. Principia had shown how to obtain the motions of bodies from a knowledge of the forces acting on them, and it also demonstrated the possibility of dealing with gravitational systems in a unified way. The next step would be to isolate a few basic force laws akin to the law of universal gravitation so that applying the basic laws to specifications of the dispositions of the ultimate parts of bodies, all of the phenomena of nature could be derived. And this really became a thing, right? Uh, especially, so there's some great history of science on this, especially in the like, last couple decades of Newton's life, whenever everybody wanted to impress Newton. Uh, they would like try to derive new force laws for something else cool. I'll come back to that in just a second. I want to do it in Newton's own words too, because I think this is I think this is important. I always try to I, I love an excuse to quote Newton. Um, this is the preface to the second edition of the Principia. Uh, if only we could derive the other phenomena of nature from mechanical principles by the same kind of reasoning. For many things have led or many things lead me to have a suspicion. That's so elevate, that's so Newton. Many things lead me to have a suspicion. Uh, that all phenomena may depend on certain forces by which the particles of bodies, by causes not yet known, either are impelled toward one another and cohere in regular figures, or repelled from one another and recede. Since these forces are unknown, philosophers have hitherto made trial of nature in vain. Uh, so this is what we're missing, right? We're missing the ability to write down all these other force laws to understand what other kinds of forces are at work. If we could just do that, we could make everything be special cases of Newtonianism. That's the kind of broad scope or unification we mean. 
There's a great article by Brown who's talking about some medical practitioners who actually try to do this in medicine right, at, right after Newton publishes Principia. A living body is compounded of canals of diverse kinds, conveying different sorts of fluids. So all these capitalized letters, right? These are definitions elsewhere in the axioms of medicine. Uh, a disease is the circulatory motion of the blood too much increased or diminished. A fever is the motion of the blood increased. It goes on for like, there's pages of this, right? Um, there's very interesting questions about like, what they were really doing here. Were they just trying to like make friends with Newton who was super powerful so they wanted to write down a force law of medicine? Unclear, really great, uh, this Brown, this, I, I highly recommend this Brown paper. It's a hoot, it's a, it's a, it's a, really, it's a really fun article. Um, before we leave scope though, after talking about you know, unifying power, before we leave scope, uh, I wanna pick up on one more thing in the Schindler, uh, namely, he makes this argument, he actually distinguishes two senses of scope, two ways that we might have meant scope. So on the one hand, we have this unifying power sense. And on the other hand, we have what he calls the empirical scope of the theory, which is just how much stuff does it apply to? How many situations, phenomena does it apply to in the natural world? And of course, right, they are certainly distinct. A theory can conjoin many facts and therefore have broad empirical scope but little unifying power. That would be the case if the theory gave us no clue as to how the conjoined facts were interrelated at the deeper level. So you can add empirical scope in this sense without adding unifying power if you just sort of stick a bunch more observations into your confirmed observations into your theory. Um, I'll use that distinction later. I bring it up because I want to come back to it. So this project got started for me when I started thinking about questions of scope in contemporary life sciences. So I'll come back to this organization in a bit. I got a, I got a cool invite. I went and gave a talk at the graduate conference of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg, which was a ball. Um, and I was trying to figure out like, what would a grad conference in mole bio want from a philosopher of biology. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna get kinda I'm gonna get kind of weird and talk about like scope and challenges for 21st century biology. So that was sort of the theme of the conference, was something along the lines of uh, uh, challenges for the challenges for the next century of, of the life sciences. Um, and so, okay, um, here I'll, I'll, I'll I'm gonna go through a bunch of slides in relatively quick succession. I'll jump, I'll jump off camera for a second. Um, what, what do we think of, right, when we talk about scope in, in the life sciences, right? Biology is supposed to be about all kinds of stuff, like reefs, and it's also supposed to be about rainforests, and it's also supposed to be about everything on this diagram, my favorite representation of the tree of life from the Hillis lab. Um, you, you're there. <laughs> You wave at yourself. This is all the other species on the planet. You know, lovely. I like the radial. The radial diagram is lovely because it, it helps to counteract this idea that we're more evolved than the other creatures on, on the planet. Um, but it's also supposed to be about stuff like this. This is a, a one of the old books talked about in the discussion of mechanical objectivity by Dass and Gallison. This is an old tissue section photographic manual. Um, you're supposed to also include this kind of thing. Um, it's called classic tissue-based uh, 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 physiological biology. Um, now we're doing more and more of this stuff. So here's a lovely mechanism of action for a uh, antidepressant uh, drug in between, in the synaptic gap between some neurons. Um, even more broadly, this is great, although uh, also shout outs to the old uh, silver theme for Windows XP. Um, this screenshot is an OG. Um, this is an individual based model of macaque monkeys from an old colleague at, uh, that I, who I worked with some at, at, at Notre Dame back in grad school. Each one of these little dots is a monkey. Um, and this is all that, this is a, a proper modeling of their terrain, I believe, in Indonesia, where you've got forests, you, you have the rivers, you have human habitation, there's roads, so like if one has to cross a road, it has a risk of getting run over by a car. I mean, this is now also part, right, of the toolkit of being a <coughs> contemporary biologist. And every bio textbook has a diagram in it that looks like this. Right, and this is really, thinking about this move right here is really what kind of got me started. Uh, thinking about this project, right? Accepting maybe some of the details about the atoms and uh, I guess biology technically only interests itself in part of the molecules, right? The rest of this stuff is supposed to be somewhere within the remit of some kind of biologist. 
Um, and this is pretty wild. And this diagram is in every single textbook of biology that, anywhere. Like every kid's textbook has this, has this picture in some form or another, right? And so, okay, great, fine, good. Um, here's what you might think, right? You might think, very, very well done. Um, you've just described uh, what biologists are doing. This is the pursuit of scope in the life sciences. Uh, right? Why not? That sure is kind of what it looks like. And the big, the big argument for today is no. Um, that's the idea. The idea is to push, is to push on something that, that actually these choices um, don't, really seem, don't really seem like scope in, in the classic sense. Uh, and, and that for, two, for at least two reasons. Uh, the two reasons that I, that I want to, or the, for many ways you can see this, I'm going to pick up on Schindler's distinction between two types of scope and use that to try to, 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 try to, to, try to show it across some examples. On the one hand, it doesn't seem like it's the pursuit, excuse me, of empirical scope uh, in a sort of raw and unadulterated way, because that would, that would be just about getting more parts of the world inside the domains of your theories. It doesn't seem like life scientists are doing that. Rather, they're, they're offering very complex reasons and very careful choices for the kinds of extensions of domain that they engage in. And it also doesn't seem like it's the pursuit of unifying power, because if you go back to that, you know, atoms to ecosystems diagram, the theories that actually let us understand biochemistry and ecosystems are radically disunified. Uh, sometimes biologists will try to talk their way around this, and this is something I'd, I'd be interested to, to talk more about and, and to, 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 to know if, if Maybe people have, have strong opinions about this. Sometimes biologists try to talk their way around this by saying like, oh, well, it's actually evolution that unifies everything. Don't worry about it. Like, if you actually look at practice, that's not what actually happens. You know, the arguments in biochemistry don't actually always, or, or even very often, uh, make these kinds of appeals that would knit the whole thing together in a kind of Kitscherian, Newtonian mechanics kind of way. At least that's the argument I want to make. And so, in short, science doesn't look like it's, or the, the practice of the life sciences doesn't look like it's directed at scope. It looks like it's directed at something else. And so that's where I want to make room for another concept, another kind of theoretical virtue that's at play. Um, so, yes, I'm going to call that breadth. Uh, as I mentioned, this is coming out of a, a larger book project. And so um, I'm going to super briefly try to give you some context um, that will come from chapters of this book that are currently like one paragraph abstracts in my head, and so I have no arguments at all. So if you stop me and try to really ask me questions in the Q&A about the next two slides, you can just watch me. I'll just curl up in the corner and, 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 like, and like hum quietly to myself. So um, what am I going to do, though? What I'm going to do eventually is I want to pick up, actually, this is the one that I'm talked about. I'm going to pick up, uh, to give some, some sort of context for how to introduce this idea before I get to give you the kind of theoretical upshot for what I think breadth is and how it works. Um, I think it's related to some of what Darwin was up to in his later natural history books. And so I actually did, I have given a talk about trying to think about how his orchid work. Um, so a lot of people don't know this after Darwin finishes up his books, his major evolutionary works. So uh, the Origin of Species and the Descent of Man. He keeps publishing loads of books, and they're about like really nitty gritty natural history. He goes and he, he goes and tries to catalog uh, the fertilization method of every single species of orchid that he can get a sample of. He writes a book on how earthworms move Earth around. He writes a book on all the plants that he can find that eat insects. I mean, like old fashioned, like good old fashioned naturalist stuff. Right? And I actually think there's a good argument to be made that Darwin's thinking in a kind of breadth kind of way rather than a scope kind of way. So I'm not going to get into that today. Um, I also think that much more contemporarily, some of our practices around big data and scientific publication uh, also echo this um, in, in interesting kinds of ways. Uh, again, not going to get much deeper into that. I also want to take a couple of things off the table, so sort of nearby debates that I think are really important, that I think will merit a chapter in the final book, but that I'm not going to talk about anymore right now. Uh, first of those is mechanistic explanation. 
Uh, so I think mechanism is really helpful here, uh, but I think the ways that mechanis mechanistic explanation tends to get at the phenomena that I'm looking at uh, in thinking about breadth tend to be things like mechanism sketches and mechanism schemas that aren't really well elaborated in the literature on mechanism that don't, that I, I don't think they give us quite enough oomph to understand what these, what the biologists are doing in these cases where I think they're making appeals to breath. Um, there's also, of course, and, and I'm, I'm already getting ready for the funny screenshot, hopefully one day, when this, if, this, if, 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 I, if I can manage to get this book published, um, when I can take a copy of breath and put it next to a copy of Strevens' is Death. Uh, so it'll be like the it'll be like the yin and yang of uh, anyway. Uh, I think depth is also really important, but I think one thing that is interesting about breadth is that it has a bit of a distinctive life science flavor to it, and that's part of what I'm trying to explore. I'd be interested to know because I know there's a lot of people here who haven't worked in the life sciences or who've worked in in other parts of the life sciences than I have. If you think when you hear what I have to say about breadth if you think that like, oh yeah, physicists are totally doing this all the time. I actually would think that's, I would, I would be very interested to hear that. Uh, but I, I don't know and I have a feeling that depth is more relevant which is part of why it forms such uh, an important uh, target of analysis for, for Strevens. Um, so, okay, um, that's, that's the context that's not written yet. So uh, hand waving, hand waving endeth. Um, so what's different? Right. Uh, uh, what I want to do is what I want to do is build build out a competitor notion, um, a competitor notion to scope. Uh, leave scope. I don't think that scope is wrong or bad or not a theoretical virtue at all. Not not at all. I have to be. I want to be very clear about that. This is not a this is not an argument against scope. But I want to try to show that either unifying power or empirical scope in in Schindler's senses. Neither of those things is the thing that I have in mind. Neither of those things is capturing something that I think is really important about contemporary life science. How do I differentiate the two? So what am I seeing as the differences? Um, I have three proposals for how we can do that. And I want to underline, I don't think these are, these are not mutually exclusive proposals. This is more like, uh, this isn't like three different ways of understanding breath. It's sort of like three overlapping perspectives on the same kind of concept, I think. This is three different ways, all of which are kind of helpful to understand the sort of notion that I, that I want to get to. All right, so I'm going I'm to talk through each of them in, in turn. So first, uh, oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, a small question no, yeah. Asia, because I've been troubled by this. So you speak of expansions of biological theory. You mean biological, a biological theory, like ecology or something? Or do you mean biological theorizing as good. a... Very good. Um, this is an important precision. Oof, how can I do this quickly? This is an important precision that I don't, that I worry that I don't have time to do justice to, because this is, this is actually really important. Um, I just, I just mean that as a question of clarification. No, no, but it's, but it's, but it's, but it's, but it's, but it's, it's, it's well, spot on, and it's a little hard to clarify. So I do, in general, mean. I guess the the right way to say this quickly is, I do, in general, mean expansions of theorizing in the life sciences in general. Now. That means that I owe you a response to a sort of implicit objection that's hiding in there, namely, why is that a reasonable thing to talk about, as opposed to um, only talking about ecology, behavioral, uh, whatever, behavioral ecology and molecular ecology and population dynamics and biochemistry and, 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 and. Um, why is it legitimate to do what I just did and talk about biological theory more broadly? Um, I owe you a response to that that I don't have time to give you today. Um, the five second version is, I think more and more that's how biologists are actually talking about what they're doing in their field. I think, I think biologists themselves are seeing the integration of those bodies of theory as a progressively more and more important problem because they are different ways of describing the same kinds of phenomena. But I owe you a lot, that's, that's a quick story to a hard, that's a quick answer to a long question. Um, so I owe you more than that that I'm not going to give you. You but gave a, but a perfect a, answer to my question. Okay. <laughs> I didn't raise the objection. You did it yourself. Okay, fair, fair. <laughs> so I'm going to go, the, these, these go from simplest to most complex. Uh, so selectivity is almost 
almost a trivial point, but I think it still merits being underlined. Um, so, yeah, the idea is choices about, about, theoret about theoretical breadth, choices about which phenomena to study next, what phenomena to let in or to rule out of our theories, don't ever seem to be made as though scope was the primary, as the, as the primary mover. Um, one way to see this is that biologists very often either take on harder cases than they have to, which isn't what you, were, what you would do if you were just looking for empirical scope, or fewer cases than you might expect, right? It's really not, and, and we'll come back to this, this is why the natural history case is important. It's really not just stamp collecting as much data as you possibly can for any reason that you can possibly find it, even in natural history. That's kind of a classic, I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a misunderstanding that has some sociological roots that we could talk about in the Q&A if people are interested, but I think that's not, that's not what's, going, what's going on here. Um, like I say, that's, that, that's, a pretty simple, that's a pretty simple point that's probably, that, that shouldn't really surprise anybody. Um, they're also opportunistic, by which I mean these choices are really heavily conditioned by whatever, what else is already going on. What else is already going on in the biosciences at the moment that we're thinking about pursuing a new domain, looking at a new phenomenon, trying to understand something that was uh, hitherto not understandable. Um, one way to see this is, of course, uh, there's lots of great literature on the role and nature of model organisms, right? Uh, having a model organism around already doing a bunch of your work in mice is going to constrain the kinds of future work that you, that you want to do. Um, and that's not, that's going to cut against, that's going to cut against the sort of classic scope type analysis. And I don't want to say, I guess the, the, an, an important qualification here is, and I don't want to say that that's just a bad thing, that we're just choosing to limit, say, our scope by sort of entrenching ourselves in the, in the use of, of a certain kind of, of model, for instance. I think this, this, there's, a, there's a positive way to spin this if you understand the role that breadth is playing and how it's working. Um, similarly, there's a lot of effort on integrations so you might think, ooh, unifying power, but they're always between very particular parts of biological theorizing. Um, they're, they're, very much, they're very much targeted around what, what's already in play. A good example, um, we're starting to see calls for eco-evo-devo. So we already had evo-devo, which if you've been attending uh, our, our various life science seminars for the last, uh, theme seminars for the last couple of years, you've, you've heard some about. So the, the integration of developmental biology with evolution, which had been left aside to some extent, was one of the themes uh, among many awesome themes of, of Miles' talk last, last week, uh, or two weeks ago. Um, now we're thinking about integrating ecology into this. And uh, Ehab Abuhif has been one of the, the leading scholars uh, uh, pushing for this kind of, this kind of integration. Um, but these are very particular, these are very particular connections having a lot to do with the sort of state of play in, on the ground already. Um, it's less about, in fact, there tends to be some suspicion around um, sort of grand efforts to really push for unifying power by going back to the fundamentals and rederiving a grand unified theory that could explain biological phenomena is a bit suspect. It depends on who's doing it. There's obviously, I'm not saying there's nobody that's up to that, that, kind of a, that kind of an approach, but a lot of biologists get a little queasy when you start talking like that. And I think that has to do with this kind of targeted integration idea of of unifying power. Now, most importantly, uh, and I think this is where this is also the other kind of big, big thing that led me to want to think about this. I think these these choices about how to expand biological theory are absolutely loaded with non-epistemic value commitments, and I think that thinking about breadth in particular as a theoretical virtue is a great way to analyze to start to unearth those non-epistemic value commitments and to talk about the kind of role that they're playing in the theory. And so that's another reason that I wanted to, that I wanted to dig this, to dig out, dig out this concept because, <laughs> because I think, um, I think it's scope, I think, I think along the lines of it being a kind of pure epistemic value, I think scope doesn't tend very often to make room for these non-epistemic value choices. 
And so I think if we just limit ourselves to thinking in terms of scope, we're going to miss a big angle that helps us understand why biologists are making the kinds of, the kinds of decisions uh, uh, that they're making. There's lots of cool examples, I think, of this. Um, I'm going to show you another one later. This is, I think, part of the upshot of my natural history case study. Um, but I, I just want just to pull on this thread a little bit. So like I said, I, I first played with this idea in a talk at the EMBL PhD symposium uh, two years ago. Uh, here's their theme from this year. Mostly I just want to show you the artwork because it's just like it's so cool. Starry night, but that's with cell culture cells, right? Um, that's just so cool. Um, the big picture, zooming into life. Um, and so what are they talking about? They're talking about what you might think is kind of a scope goal. So they're talking about integrating across scales. They're talking about being able to move from organismic to systemic to tissue to cellular to biochemical levels in biological explanations. But then if you look at how they think about justifying this, like why do we care? Why is this something that we need to do? Uh, well, no better example can be given than the current pandemic where researchers in different fields have collaborated to bring about a rapid research-driven response against the novel coronavirus. We are dedicated to creating a symposium that brings together researchers who study life sciences at different scales and explore the interdisciplinary approaches utilized to link the different scales of life. So they go right to, this is how, we're gonna, this is how we stopped COVID, right? Integration across levels is, is how we stopped COVID. You get immediately to a kind of, a kind of non-epistemic non value move. Um, as an aside, I also think this is really neat. Um, that's something I'll get into more later on, not, or not today, more later on when I'm writing about this. I think this is another really cool example of something that a number of scholars have actually been talking about a lot lately, which is that the frontier between epistemic and non-epistemic values is a whole lot blurrier than a lot of people give it credit for. I think breadth is really cool because it's smack in between the two. So you get some considerations like, I'm in a model organism and it's going to be much easier for me in my laboratory to contextualize my empirical data because I already know a lot about mice. You're like, oh yeah, epistemic, you know, cool. And then you get, and we want, by the way, we also want to stop COVID. And they're really hard mixing those things together. And I think that's a really lovely, another really lovely aspect of this, of this case. Um, so in short, right, I think this is not the pursuit of scope. I think it's the pursuit of breadth. And I think that making this distinction gives us a really useful tool for understanding these kinds of moves with respect to theories in the contemporary life sciences. So I haven't given you enough theory there to really sell how I think that's supposed to work, but let me give you a case study with the, uh, with the hopeful, oh, actually wait, let me give you some objections and then let me give you a case study that I hope will help better sell it. Um, so let me pause, yeah, let me pause, you've probably already thought of a couple objections, I just want to canvas a few, I know I'm already running a little low on time, but uh, is breadth just a way of talking about fruitfulness? So maybe, maybe you might think that, that that's, that's sort of what I've meant is, is I'm not, this isn't anything different, this is just a way of sort of demonstrating to fellow collaborators that maybe you have a research program that can give uh, interesting kinds of further, of further insights, future lines of research. Um, but that's, to me that seems to run afoul of a few of these cases insofar as what I want to argue is a lot of the times when biologists are pushing in the direction of increasing breadth, they're doing it by picking up really experimental stuff that very well may not succeed. So system integration stuff to talk about COVID is pretty hyper experimental. Uh, so is eco evo devo. Eco evo devo might not work at all. So saying that that's a way of talking about fruitfulness seems a little seems a little off a little off base to me. Um, is it just a way of talking about idealization or generalization? This is another really good objection. I think not but I need to work more on why. I think idealization and generalization are really important because they're tools that you can use to get to breadth, but they're not virtues in and of themselves. And so that requires me to talk a little bit more about what a theoretical virtue is and why I think people are pursuing breadth in itself, but not idealization or generalization in themselves. I really need to engage with, uh, with uh, Potoshnik's new book on idealization, and I have not had the time to, to read it yet, so I'm, I'm behind on that. Um, last objection, is breath just a way to talk about a bunch of pragmatic stuff? So maybe we talk about COVID because we want money. 
Um, and maybe we talk, then we do the kinds of integrations we can because we're cheap and we don't want to spend more on a new kind of lab animal. Um, maybe, maybe. And I'll be happy to admit that. Uh, this is a bullet, this is a bullet that I'm biting. Um, but I think it gives us a way to analyze certain kinds of uses of these pragmatic concerns to kind of make them apparent in a way that they weren't really before. So that's, that's why I'm saying I think it's still useful, even if sometimes it only seems like it's uh, a sort of pragmatic thing. Um, so let me give you a case study about natural history. Uh, I wanted to pick up on a few arguments that I think at least are actually debates about breadth in contemporary biology. Um, so yeah, I want to talk through this fight really quickly. I've, yeah, I've got, about, I've got about 15. I can talk through this fight about the importance of natural history to contemporary biology. So what exactly is natural history? So in general, it's a descriptive enterprise, right? It's often pit against anything theoretical. Uh, it involves doing stuff like cataloging species, understanding their ranges, understanding their behaviors, uh, their environmental relationships. There's a definition from a survey article by Tewksbury et al. that I'm going to come back to. The observation and description of the natural world with the study of organisms and their linkages to the environment being central. Like, okay, cool. Um, reasonable enough. In the extreme, it's taken to be entirely atheoretical. I literally laughed out loud at this quote in my office the other day. And it's most stereotyped, natural history has been and is strictly phenomenological. This is unexciting, but not totally evil. Um, so, yeah, and it, in, in extremis, natural history might only be accumulation of data without putting them in any kind of theoretical framework. As we'll see, I think that's, over, that's overdrawn. I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But what all this means, right, is that natural history is seen as being increasingly old-fashioned. Uh, over the end of the 19th and the early 20th, there's some lovely work about how this shifts during the Victorian period. Paul Farber is immense here. Um, as evolution and genetics start to give a structure, a theoretical superstructure to natural history research, even saying that you're doing natural history becomes steadily less fashionable. You have to say that you're doing evolutionary biology, or you're doing behavioral ecology, or now molecular ecology, eco evo -devo. Um and so what starts to happen, and yeah, here this is a, from, from a, a, a quick little article by, by Allen who writes that you know, suddenly, and this, suddenly this is around you know, in, the late, in, the late eight, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, uh, naturalists found themselves being told that what they had all along been accustomed to think of as useful and even in some cases valuable scientific work was no longer of very much moment and worse ought for preference to be abandoned and a quite different approach adopted in its stead. And so this is the story that we get, that we get told about, about this history, that, that natural history sort of falls out of favor as people recognize an increasing necessity to kind of theoretically contextualize that kind of work, uh, especially with the aid of Darwinism and then uh, genetics. Um, and in contemporary science, this is still a thing. Uh, so this is an old article by Bartholomew, well for science, um, an old article from, the, from 86 by Bartholomew, but I can find you examples up to last week if you want. Um, in contemporary biology, much of the glamour and most of the funding, there's the real problem, right? Um, go to research on the lower levels of integration, so biochemical, uh, molecular, biological. At these levels, active researchers generally agree on the key questions. This consensus is so complete that we see large numbers of highly intelligent investigators with a treasure trove of instrumentation and techniques, all concentrating on a few questions. And so this, this is part of an article that is an impassioned appeal to refund natural history, to put more money into natural history research again. Um, <clears throat> One thing I, I do want to point out, because I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give this and then I'm going to take it away again. Um, I want to point out that this, this actually looks pretty epistemic, right? This looks like um, one of the interesting distinctions between what happens in, in natural history and what happens in molecular biology is that molecular biology is sort of better unified around a paradigm. 
It's better able to narrow down and render more precise the kinds of questions that it wants to ask. And so there's more shared context between the investigators. It's easier to sell why your results are really important. And you don't have that in natural, in natural history. Um, and that's really interesting. Like I say, I'm going to come back to that. Well, go. So what's the problem anyway? Why is this bad? Why do I care? Why is this a fight? Why should I listen to the impassioned appeals to refinance natural history? Um, again, we can pick up with some more epi sort of pretty epistemic reasons. So here again from, from Bartholomew. Um, Noting natural history allows an investigator to phrase questions with precision. It facilitates synthesis from lower to higher levels of integration and can help orient those biological sectors that focus on physiological mechanisms and issues far removed from the organisms they make up. And so this looks a bit like an appeal to you know, accuracy and fertility in a classic kind of theoretical virtue sense, right? Natural, natural history helps us perform successful cross-level integrations, and it guides the generation of interesting novel research questions. Um, you get the same argument from the eminent herpetologist Harry Green, Right, so organisms themselves embody genetics, development, morphology, physiology, and behavior, and they're the fundamental components of populations, communities, and ecosystems. An understanding of organisms in nature is thus integral to studies at both lower and higher levels in the hierarchy of biological complexity. So you get this idea again, like it's in organisms that all these different parts of what's going on in the biological world, get brought together and sort of hit the road. Uh, it's, where the, it's where the rubber meets the road. And so in that sense, it's organisms that you should care about. You should invest your time in understanding how they work. And it will rebound both to lower and higher levels of, uh, of the hierarchy. But, and this I think is really interesting, you also get some pretty strong skepticism in the biology community about the relevance of these results. Um, I'll give you a cited source in a second, but also a bunch of the biologists that I follow on Twitter. I was having a long, I had a long Twitter thread about this the other day. And a bunch of people, especially, especially uh, 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 junior researchers were kind of going, yeah, but look, you know, people about my career stage were going kind of, look, wait, um, are we really fighting about this anymore? Does anybody really think that we shouldn't study organisms? Is there really anybody on the other side of this debate? Like who, I, I posted the question trying to ask, like mining for papers, who argues against this in print? And there's not really anybody. So there's a little bit of a skepticism about the depth of the epistemic side of this disagreement. Uh, there's a famous much cited article expressing that skepticism by uh, Stefan Arnold who writes, the crux of the natural history tradition is the search for order in nature. So Arnold wants to kind of move the goalposts a little bit about how to understand what natural history is doing. Um, that's a move that I don't really have time to get into right now. It's kind of cool and we can talk about it in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, the goal of that tradition is and always has been to formulate concepts that allow us to perceive order in nature. So now it's about concept formulation, right? Not charting ranges of species. Uh, it's the pursuit of the goal rather than the tools of employment that defines the tradition and hence the naturalist. The tools of the naturalist are equations and sequencers as well as binoculars and notebook. Right? So this is an attempt to kind of, uh, uh, as, he writes, as he writes later, to claim uh, sort of under the mantle of natural history a bunch of the disciplines that sort of diverged from natural history. Right? So now if we talk about behavioral ecology no longer as being part of natural history because it's become more theoretical and it has uh, mathematical models and such like. Um, well, but no, because it shares an evolutionary history, it's sort of part of the, the, the family natural history, even if none of those people would call themselves natural historians or naturalists anymore. Um, and so Green, Harry Green, uh, in a goes on to argue in that paper that I that I quoted from that I quoted from before and he's talking about this dispute between people like his former self I'll show you an earlier paper in a minute and Arnold over whether or not there is a problem with natural history what uh, do we really have something we need to change or is everything actually fine do we all actually agree 
He says, well, when you unpack the epistemic side of this debate, a dispute among us looks to be a red herring, an emotional but largely inconsequential misunderstanding that's perhaps been fueled in part by fuzzy, interchangeable use of the words theory, models, and concept building on the one hand, and natural history organism focused and empiricism on the other. So it turns out that we all agree about the majority of the epistemic side of this. So for all that I could show you those quotes saying that it looks like there's some real epistemic value distinction between the kind of pro-natural history people and the anti-natural history people, perhaps it turns out there's not really any epistemic distinction there at all. Maybe we agree about everything anyway. So what's left of the debate? Why am I talking about this? I said there was a debate. I didn't say there was a happy, fun agreement time. Um, what's left of the debate after we clear away these misunderstandings about epistemic values? Uh, well, moving among these levels is important for addressing what Green calls, just after that last kind of conciliatory quote that I cited, environmental dilemmas. So Arnold expressed no concerns, unlike Green and others, for the empirical and educational aspects of natural history sensu stricto, so the good old fashioned stuff, not, not, not Arnold's expanded definition. For Tuma, Dayton, and I, uh, several uh, illustrious natural history advocates, um, are particularly concerned that we lack sufficient empirical reference points to move reliably among scales of time, space, and biological organization. And, and here's the, here's the kicker, that science therefore cannot adequately address environmental dilemmas. So we move right into a kind of, well, what is it that makes something an environmental dilemma? Well, it's a pretty paradigmatic non-epistemic value judgment if I ever saw one. This is a societal question, right? What are the challenges that are being posed to us in the study of biodiversity and natural history today? Um, a few decades earlier, Green again with uh, Jonathan Losas catch this out in terms of biodiversity and the special value of certain kinds of species. So uh, the importance of systematics and natural history thus lies in defining the boundaries and contours of organismic diversity. And a bit later in the paper, it's because of phylogenetic systematics, so the, the tracing out of relationships between species, that we can place special value on the coelacanth, the tuatara, and other living fossils, and that we hypothesize that chimpanzees, not gorillas, are our closest relatives. Um, perhaps, perhaps living fossils have some epistemic value. That's a question that we could, that's a question that we could unpack. But uh, it seems pretty clear that, that we want to know who our closest relatives are for not purely, at least, epistemic kinds of reasons. This is a, we, we're, we're moving beyond a sort of raw epistemic value discussion here. Uh, the best way to make this point, so I, I brought up uh, this definition of natural history from the survey article by Tewksbury et al. Uh, and this survey is entirely structured around the importance of natural history for broad, broader societal purposes. So they, the sections of their paper, the core sections where they defend the importance of natural history are about human health, food security, conservation and management, and human recreation. And it's all summed up in a section titled, Natural History in Academia Connecting Science and Society. Right? This is, what I, this is why the debate, this is what's left, I should say, of the debate over, over natural history. And so, again, just to, in case you weren't getting the point, what's left is, right, I think what's left is a debate about breadth. Right. In fact, it turns out that most of the epistemic stuff, there may be a bit left around the edges here and there about how we understand what we're doing. But most of the epistemic stuff uh, turns out to actually not really be a matter of deep disagreement. It's more like a, a kind of linguistic, emphatic, or emphasis, matter of emphasis uh, uh, kind of fight about how we talk about what we're doing. Um, what's left is pitting on the one side, I would say, certain kinds of non-epistemic values. So people who think that the point of biological science, the point of biological theorizing, should be to give us what we need to intervene in these kinds of non-epistemically important cases, uh, these kinds of conservation, uh, human health, et cetera, cases. And then people on the other side 
to the extent that I think that we can reconstruct on the other side, um, who are arguing more opportunistically for sort of tool use. Like, look, we, that, that stuff is good, but it's really hard to do that kind of work. We'll be much better off if we stick with the kinds of broad scale sequencing projects, for example, that we've been up to already, uh, and don't try to make those connections to natural history. Uh, to the extent that there's, a, that there's a fight here then, I think this looks a lot, a lot like a breadth fight. I think this bears all the hallmarks of invoking exactly the kind of concept that I wanted to talk about earlier. So, um, believe it or not, with that, I am actually done, and I'm really happy to talk about this, get rotten fruit, thanks, comments, questions, etc. So, thank you all for being here. Let me get a pen to write. Actually, do you want to take a little break? Uh, I was about to ask. I also wanted to say perfect timing, uh, and uh, I'm not against breaks. I, I like I like breaks as well. Let's do breaks. Uh, you know, queue up in front of the toilet. And and the coffee machine. <laughs> uh, <also not> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's let's take five. That sounds great. I'm gonna I'll, I'll I'll cut the mic, but we'll be we'll be back on stream in five.
No, I didn't. There you go. I should have turned the microphone back on. Cool. Okay. Uh, first, I saw. Which guy was here? Petrus first, but he already has his five minutes of yes. game. So, and <laughs> you're at the last of the queue. Okay, then I saw first. Yeah. Thank you for the um, This type of, uh, of uh, values, uh, probability values, is kind of thing that I would think of uh, for like. Uh, Nuclear research in physics in the 60s, or like graphene and superconductor in physics right now. Mm. Uh, it's the difference that uh, your approach is more like bottom up rather than uh, top down. Like uh, the scientific community decides what an impact for society rather than the society or the government you need to do this kind of research. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think I, I do want to say that this is this is internally driven, right? And I, I think it's very, you know, you. You hear it talked about very much in these kinds of kinds of career motivation kind of terms, I think, right? Where where people really talk about what yeah, they talk about it in terms of what kinds of impacts they want to have and what kinds of, you know, how they want to Yeah. So I, I think I think I think you're exactly right. I think it's 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 less uh, that's really interesting, you know, actually, by comparison, it would be interesting to compare some of these cases because there are cases in the life sciences where this kind of thing is imposed externally. Right, so you see something like uh, a little bit the Human Genome Project, just because it was an obscene amount of money, but also I would think more more pertinently, it was in the Obama administration. The U.S. government launched this thing they called the Brain Initiative, um, which was just an extremely vague way to say that they were going to back up trucks of money in front of every laboratory that could say they were working on brains. Um, and it would be interesting to see how kind of what people say about those kinds of projects and if it's different than what people say when they do something like try to defend natural history because it's going to help you know human health. Um, I don't think I mean, the even, more, the even more provocative way to put that one objection that I mentioned, um, when I say argue, you know, is this just pragmatic stuff? I mean, you might also say, is all this just totally insincere garbage that they write because they want people to like them and give them money? And I do think the answer to that is no. I mean, I really do. I really honestly think the answer to that is no. I think when they, I think when they write a defense of natural history that it will that they do think it will help, you know, human health and food security and conservation. I think they legitimately I think they do legitimately believe this. I I, I don't want to I don't want to impugn their motives. But I do think it would be interesting to compare an internally driven case and an externally driven case. That's a really cool idea. Okay, so I have the eyesight of a cow, so I saw right and left the first. <laughs> I think I saw Juliet. I'm, I'm seeing today. Yeah. So no. ah, okay. You didn't have a question. Okay. Let's just. Ah, okay. Uh, you were first. <laughs> no, it's not about being first. It's about me deciding who. I'm <laughs> <laughs> <It's really good. laughs> Max wants. Okay. So, what would be the question when you press? <coughs> Now, Ooh, good. Um, <clears throat> I want to say yes. Um, I'm tempted to say. I mean, so so this is actually one uh, where I have to where I have to con confess that I, I I have much more work to do. Um, again, one of those one of those chapters I skipped over. Um, the best answer might be depth. That is to say, trying to, you know, going, going, going out instead of going down. I mean, in that, in that sense. Um, the, the problem with that answer is that in cases like natural history, you see breadth arguments that talk a lot about level integration, which also feels like depth, which is a weird, the relation here is going to be really complicated. That's why, I, that's why I have a chapter penciled in for it that I haven't started work on yet. So in some sense the contrary is in some sense the contrary is depth, but at the same time people are invoking both at the same time. So there also may be a kind of trade-off question at work here. Um, 
you know, sometimes you'll hear you'll hear scientists describe a sort of tension between uh, how to put it this kind of natural drive again. Whether, whether we think this is philosophically well-founded or not, that's not my position to talk about for the moment. But this kind of natural drive toward the quality of a reductionist answer, right? So, oh yes, you know, how do we make our systems biology explanations better? We put in more biochemical detail. And you know, how do we make our biochemical explanations better? We put in more biophysical detail. Um, and you'll hear scientists talk about the tension between doing that and making their job so bloody complicated that they have no idea what they're supposed to do now. They, don't, they have models they can't use. Um, and so maybe there's a bit of a trade-off dynamic here, but I, I need, basically what I really need to do is I need to get much clearer on uh, both Strevens and uh, Woodward and Hitchcock, who are the you know, kind of main people who've talked about depth and try to think about how that contrasts with what I've with what I'm trying to build here, and I, I don't have a good answer about it yet. Because that's what we do my next question. When you share one of the concepts, you have, I don't talk about mechanisms. I don't talk. We don't talk about relation. Either. Yeah, so good. And I think that the concept relation popping up. And this is precisely just one of those things that, for instance, why we say uh, you're looking for an explanation for theory, and like, the new theory is uh, can you. To narrow its to narrow its code and just things like that. There yeah. No, I think. Yeah. So I think. I think I would want to say. I think. I think I would want to say. I think. Uh, again, ah, I knew you guys would make me like have opinions about the stuff I haven't thought about yet. Dang. Um, I know. I think what I want to say is. Uh, that I want to talk about reductionism as a, in, a, in, a, in, a depth, in a depth context is how I, want to, how I want to get at that same kind of drive. But I, I don't know enough to be able to really cash that out yet. That's where I want to pick up on that thread, uh, but I don't know how to do it yet. But yes, two very important things that I'm going to have to talk a lot about. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Juliette, maybe first, and don't worry. For all of you, just a lot of time, no child left behind. <laughs> well, well. Um, so my question is, is really again about the concept of web. Um, because I'm still a bit struggling to understand what's the distinction with scope. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a difficult question. What would you translate to in French? Like, have you yeah, it is. It is hard. I've actually, I've, I've, I've run across this. I've run, because I was gonna, I gave a version of, I gave a very short version of this talk at the SPS, and I was like, I can't give it in French because I don't know how I would translate the central concept. Um, I mean, it's ampleur, but ampleur is also scope. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's the can be Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is a real. It's a really funny problem. It's a really funny problem. Um, I mean, perhaps the, perhaps the most, uh, uh, in some sense, this is a very silly way to put it, but I think it might be illustrative. Um, one might be, one might, one, one might reduce, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make a joke at my own expense. One might reduce the entire, you know, try to, theoretical apparatus I tried to build about what breadth is, is to something like, breadth is scope, but when you do it on purpose, like carefully. Uh, now, good. So, so there is an interesting. There is there is another interesting question that, that's that's right around here that I've that I've uh, I've received before, and I'm still not sure what to do with. And that is so like, is this a theoretical virtue, or is it more like I don't know, like a, a axiological motivational something? <laughs> is, this, is this your question? <laughs> Go for it. How in Spanish? I, I, I don't have a Matthew. Oh, it was your question. I'm saying in Spanish. I did not get a translation from it. No, I, I don't have one. I don't have one. It's because I, I really don't. That's why I didn't give the. I would have tried to give the SBS talk in French just to give a shot at a professional talk because it's only 20 minutes and it's a pretty chill environment. I would have given it a try. Uh, but I was like, if I can't translate breath into French, I guess I'm not giving the talk in French. <laughs> <laughs> Etendu. Okay, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's on. 
Mm. Does that make sense? No. That's that's like physical. That's like and the, that's like length. The example sentence is l'étendue des connaissances du scientifique est remarquable. Doesn't that sound good? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Hmm. I mean, I'm not asking this to be annoying. It's just no, no, it's a really. It, it helps to, you know. Yeah, like, can you. Because I still struggle to distinguish between the two concepts in English. That's mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Exactly. Yeah, maybe not sure. Width. Uh. Uh. He said, I can I feel like this is something we have to workshop over a beer after this. This is the perfect workshop over a beer question. <laughs> Were you saying that you have like a fast, uh, to the point remark about this very question? Otherwise, I have to, you know. <laughs> Right. Uh, no, question. If it's related, <laughs> then, if it's related, then you know. yeah. there's also time for there's time for everybody. Maybe not, not you. Okay. Uh, many thanks, Charles, for the talk. It was really interesting. Great. Yeah. Um, my point is more or less this one. Um, in, the, in the discussion about epistemic uh, or some non-empirical virtual of, of theories, what you usually have is different competing theories. Right? I mean, you have some evidence and you have this underdetermination, so you have different competing theories that account for the empirical data more or less in the same way. So if you start to apply different criteria for theory choice, simplicity, scope, or. But it, it's clear that this, 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 this beer just makes sense if you have alternative theories competing. Yeah, so simplicity, simplicity in isolation makes not much sense. It's simplicity with respect to another theory that. Right. Right. But in, in your account of breath, it seems something uh, that is not related to a theory. It's not a virtual theory, but it's like a normative, uh, normative uh, uh, stance to integrate different theories in a particular way, in, in, even within a particular field. And I mean, so my, 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 my question was more or if you were thinking more or less in, in this line. Yeah. Good, good. And so this actually gets at, at this worry that I had. So, so Something like that worry is why I started initially thinking about this in terms of explanations mm -hmm. instead of the theories. Because mm -hmm. now we're talking about, you know, if the question is what kinds of resources should we draw on in, it, in order to explain certain kinds of biological phenomena, or for that matter, uh, one could still say that it's a question of explanatory virtues, um, which phenomena merit an explanation and which do not. Um, now, I started there because of these kinds of worries. I, got, I was pushed back toward theoretical virtues. Well, precisely because, so then, so then you start thinking about, so what are you going to build this with, re with reference to? And if you want to use, if you're thinking about it in terms of a, a comparison with scope, was scope really an explanatory virtue? Well, not really. It seems more like a theoretical virtue, but it is related to breadth. And so maybe the long-winded the long answer to this is that what this is showing me is that what I really need is an account about sort of... So clearly there's some kind of relationship between theoretical virtues and the virtues of explanations provided by those theories. Um, but explain, there's not really a lot of good discussion about explanatory virtues in the literature, and so I, I, I'm torn about what to do about this. Um, yeah, in some sense, my ideal answer to your question would be to have an account where I basically said, you know, you might think that this was all just about getting theories that have more scope. But as it turns out, theories with more scope won't generate explanations with more breadth. Mm -hmm. okay. Maybe that's the right move here, but man, actually defending that move and figuring out even how to define your terms to be able to state that move clearly, it's really hard. And I don't have, I, I'm not sure what to do about it yet. Um, but you may be, I mean, that's, I, I, I worried about, I worried when I was going through a few days ago and kind of, so when I gave this, uh, 
when I gave this to the SPS, it was all in terms of explanatory, explanatory virtues. And I think very rightly, uh, uh, Thomas Redon from the back was like, the heck is an explanatory virtue? I mean, not in those, he's much nicer than that. He's a, I don't mean to say that, he's a good friend of mine. But like, he was like, come on, like, what do you, like, what do you, what is, like, can you give me an account of what those are? And if you, if you can't, like, how can you tell me about how to evaluate them? And I'm like, no, I really, I have no account or even any idea of what an account might even look like for what those are. And that's bad. Whereas there is a really nice account, there's a lot of philosophy that's been done about what's going on with uh, theoretical virtues. So I really don't, I really don't know how to, this is, a, this is a nut that I haven't figured out how to crack. And it is kind of, it, it's a little scary because it is pretty central to the project. <laughs> Um, but you're but you're exactly right about like like who exactly is evaluating what? Yeah. That's uh, that's that's not clear. But part of the problem is that that's not ever really clear in the philosophy of science. Um, so yeah, I, I if anyone has clever ideas about how to or or a paper I've missed about that will help me understand this, I would love to hear them. Uh, because, yeah, I, I feel this, okay. and I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's pass the button to Max. Yes, my, my question is also on that line. Because um, I was trying to understand exactly what you meant by breath, and sort of exactly what it was. And, and sort of, I was a bit confused by, by saying it was a theoretical value because Especially, I was thinking of a specific kind of example where sort of um, it, the idea of theoretical value didn't seem to apply that much, which is um, in the relationship between breath and data, and this uh, the idea of data driven science, right? Which I think is very common in, in the natural sciences, in the life sciences. And sort of, it seems that epistemic virtues rather than theoretical virtues. Are more applicable here, so the epistemic virtues in the notion, in the sense of that mechanism and so on, which, which you mentioned. So I, I didn't understand what was the difference between epistemic and theoretical virtues, because I feel like the, there is a difference. Theoretical virtues seem to be a Good. sort of subset of epistemic virtues understood. I think epistemic virtues are a bit more broad; they encompass other kind of scientific practices. Uh, good. So we have we have a little bit of con of conflict of terminology here. But actually, this may be really productive because maybe it's this broader sense. This because uh, I, I had actually entirely forgotten about that broader sense of epistemic virtue, in terms of like the virtues of a good scientist, right? right? So just to be just to be super precise, right? Yeah. So in that sense, to be to be to be hyper clear, epistemic virtue, uh, well, theoretical virtues are applied to theories, but it's still probably a subset of the same kinds of virtues. Of those, some of those are epistemic values and others are non-epistemic values, right? In the, uh, 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 sorry, who wrote that? Uh, uh, McMullen, the Arnie McMullen sense. So some of, some kinds of values, uh, some kinds of theoretical virtues we value because they lead us toward true, we think they lead us toward true theories, and those are the epistemic ones. And some we value because they lead us toward uh, something else, like a notion of the good. And those are the non-epistemic values. So there is a bit of a kind of terminology overlap here. But maybe exactly epistemic virtue in this kind of sts -E sense is exactly what I need. Um, I need to go sit and think about that. Right, because so my... my how I was understanding breath is like you mentioned later that it's like scope with motivation, so I was thinking of breath as scope plus social relevance. I don't know if that's how you were thinking of it, but that's how I was picturing my mind. So in that sense, if you add to the theoretical aspect and the epistemic aspect the, the scope plus the social relevance, that's where you have the, the epistemic virtues in the sense of what is yeah. the scientist. Yeah, so I don't just want to say social relevance, right? Because I think the kind of uh, I think the uh, uh, the kind of opportunism angle is also really important, and isn't quite social relevance. It's it's still it's more you know, it's more uh, 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 practically focused than that. Right. Um, but I do think you know I, I do think that yeah yeah how to how to talk about what these yeah yeah how to talk about what these virtues attach to and inhere in. Um, 
You know, I'm a little worried because, you know, if you get too broad, right, in some of these, like, I don't want to go all the way to, like, a Stephen Shapin type thing where I say that, you know, no, it's, it's like the scientist must appreciate, must have breadth. Like, you know, I don't want them to be, like, properties of a good knower. I don't think I want to go quite that far. Um, so I need to find somewhere in between, and I, I, haven't, I haven't quite cracked the code yet on uh, where to do that. Um, yeah, I, I hesitate to go because I do think there is something kind of, uh, uh, well, it's not there's nothing interpersonal about the epistemic virtues in that, in, that, in that broader STS sense. But you know what I mean. I think there's something more, uh, uh, they are about the science more than they are about the people. Um, no, it's a, yeah, that's a, I need to, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a potentially really useful resource. Thanks. I need to go back and think about that. I haven't, I haven't picked that stuff up that, uh, like that, uh, that gals and stuff in forever. And just one more time. Yeah. Uh, if I can. Uh, so, yeah, I was thinking about the, the, the because you seem breath to, to, so the people who pursue breath um, or a, a theory, theory with a large breath is one that, that kind of sort of links several um, stages, right? And or at least that's, what some, that's how some people cash out, right. I think, yeah. yeah. So I was thinking of, of like you said, the human brain project that sort of had this image of, of making this models of the brain um, through modeling, right? Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. I was thinking, what does the place of, of data and, and data-driven science, especially, Good. that have in this? Because Good. they precisely claim the opposite, right? To be theoryless, and that's the way yeah. they can Good. link between uh, different uh, Good. model, different levels of the model, and especially be unbiased and be sort of sort of objective, right? So I was thinking, what Play in, in, in breath. Yeah, good. Um, well, as you saw, another thing I want to write a chapter about. Um, so, what can I say given my given my my current lack of research about that chapter? Um, yeah. I think it's a really important, well, the long and short of it is I think it's a really important case study. I think it's a really important piece of context because I think it is how, um, what's one thing that's interesting here is I think it is how, it is one of the ways, it's probably the best way to say it, it's one of the ways that a variety of contemporary life scientists, I think, would say, would tell you, if I, if I just went in blind and described to a biologist what breadth is, and it was like, look, so, so it, to what extent and in what ways do you think your work exemplifies this kind of concept? I think a lot of contemporary practitioners would give you some kind of an answer that had the word database in it somewhere, right? I think you're exactly right, right? That's going to be a really common element of a response. Um, and I don't want to say that that's wrong. Uh, so actually, this is another really, in, in point of fact, that's another really good argument against calling that a theoretical virtue, right? Well, because they, they precisely say that it's a theoretical At least they claim. Now, I think that's, I mean, I think that doesn't make any sense in the end. I think most philosophers of science don't think that that makes any sense. But, but at the same time, it would be weird to say that they simultaneously are taking as very central something that I'm saying has to do with theory at the same time as they are also taking as very central the claim that they're not doing any theory. That would feel like a very odd conjunction of points to claim. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's, another, that's, a, that's another, that links really well with the current kind of, with the current run of, run of, of worries that, 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 that people are having about that, which I think is really nice. Now, more directly, like what, what do I want to, you know, what do I want to say about it in, in particular? Um, but in short, what I want to say is what I want to say is exactly, and what I also want to say is, and at least let me let me advance let me advance a provocative hypothesis that I haven't even begun to research, so I have no idea if it will if it will end up being falsified. 
My suspicion is that it's going to look a whole lot like the natural history case in the sense that they're going to talk sometimes as though they're hoovering up everything they can find willy-nilly just because they want to have as much data in their databases as they possibly can. But when you actually go interrogate the practice, you find that they're hoovering up data according to exactly these kinds of opportunistic and value-driven kinds of choices that are being made in the natural history context. That's my un completely unsupported hypothesis. I can't give you a, I literally can't give you a single example because I haven't started research on that part of the book yet. But that's my, my official guess is that in point of fact, data-driven science practice is going to show us instances of breadth arguments or uh, breadth-related decisions made with the goal of improving breadth in my sense, um, I think. But I can't, like I say, I don't have any examples yet. Mm. Did you still have a question, Peter? Because you haven't been able to. But uh, <laughs> um, it's still 29 minutes. Yeah, we okay, have Okay, then ma maybe you were more assertive. Sorry. Okay. Um, so you were wondering, because you said you didn't have any arguments in mind about this specific topic. But, so I, I got interested into uh, medical data collection practice, I guess. Because it's very similar to what happens to natural history, although it happened basically to medical museums. Like they were collecting. Oh right, and yeah. Then, you know that's it's not happening anymore, or it's happening differently. And uh, and so one argument that was very interesting uh, was that sometimes we collect stuff and we don't know why yet, so there is no theoretical goal. But in the future, it, we might discover that it's very useful. And actually, it happened in, for medical music, for instance. You know, they suddenly went back to this old uh, organ in a bottle and uh, you know, body in a grave, and they discovered stuff that was very useful. Yeah. In the future, there's like some uncertainty about about what we what useful it we have for the data we are collecting. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's, no, that's, that, that, that's really cool. And there's, there's something in there about, that's, that's an aspect, I'd have to think about this more, but my, my initial instinct is to say that that's a cool aspect, kind of. And I, and I read natural historians, like, push for this argument. Yeah. So I yeah, I, 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 I've seen, for example, um, what is, uh, there's, there's some that are, uh, oh, yeah. We confirmed, if I'm remembering my case study correctly, we confirmed some of the damaging uh, effects of DDT, pesticide use, by going back and looking at like birds collected in natural history exhibits and we realized that their skeletons were wasting away over the course of the like middle of the 20th century. I mean, in medicine, we, we did some stuff on the Spanish flu, for example. Sure. So it could be very relevant. Yeah. No, that's, and that, so I, I'm inclined to say that there's an interesting question here. Both, both, I mean, so both there are obviously some interesting value judgments pay going on in there, and I have to think a lot harder about what is actually at stake, like what, what, what the motivations really are. There's also a sort of, there's like a double reverse question of opportunism here too, right? About like, don't be too opportunistic in terms of just going with what you have, because this becomes, this will become a burden later on. Um, but that's a, that's a really cool that's a really cool idea for 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 another for another way to think about part of the case study. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, I will send the paper. Yeah, please do. That's great. I can now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, I, I well, I, I try to understand the concept of, of bread. I, I find I find it inspiring. I, I find it. Uh, like I have the feeling that there's something uh, in there that is not in the other virtue that I've been describing in the literature. So I think it's, it's very worthwhile, uh, but I'm not sure I understand it yet uh, fully. And first I'm wondering uh, whether it's, some, it's, it's, it's a concept that's created by you in the sense of um, like it's some intuition you have and you just looked for a word and you that word on it, or 
it's something that, that scientists actually use. Uh, okay. but they claim that okay. my theory has more breadth. And that's kind of a thing that you want no. to give a I, rational uh, reconstruction of. I the word is the word is mine. The word is mine. The 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 pattern I, I detected this pattern in practice that I want to give a decent explanation for. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's but, what I thought. Yeah. To the best of my knowledge, nobody's 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 thought about this yet. Okay. Uh, and I I got very lucky. I did a pretty deep. I tried to do a pretty exhaustive literature search, and nobody's used breadth yet to describe anything in the philosophy of science. Good. <laughs> so, well, maybe it's a terrible word. Maybe it's a cursed you're word. You're never sure about it. You're never sure. Um, so we yeah. shouldn't use too much our intuitions then about these things if it's, I mean, you, you stipulate... Uh, it is intended to be a stipulative uh, definition, okay. yes. Uh, but, but nevertheless, I'll try to uh, uh, say something about my intuitions about it, given everything that has been said, and then you can say yeah, yeah, yeah. why they are wrong, uh, because they probably are wrong. But, uh, so, so breadth seems like it is derived from broad, <laughs> uh, like depth from deep, right? Uh, so the, the property that a theory has, or that a theorizing has, is to be broad, or be broader than some other phenomenon of theorizing, right? Uh, is it then true that a theory is uh, broader, or theorizing is broader than another one, if it, for the same phenomena, uh, provides, or potentially will provide, answers to more useful questions, other more useful questions. Mm. So you don't uh, enlarge the scope necessarily. They might be exactly the same phenomena and the same empirical stuff. But you, you can answer more useful, and then useful can be ethically useful or theoretically useful or whatever, uh, uh, questions about, about those very empirical stuff happening. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that's kind of... Yeah. Does that make any sense at all, or...? No, that's, that's actually, that's a, that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting way to think about it. So, so, so to try to, yeah, to try to define it very, um... What that does is that, 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 that would be a fun way to get out of the kind of, how to put it, the kind of scope plus frame that I'm in right now, which is kind of how I've been thinking about it, which is not there's anything wrong with that. I think that captures the phenomenon decently well. Um, but maybe, yeah. Uh, uh, also that, I mean, there's a sense in which uh, I, I, like, I like invoking useful too, because in some sense... Um, you might say that uh, those various overlapping ideas about how to pick out breath as distinct from scope uh, that I offered are sort of different ways of thinking about utility or different yeah. concepts of utility, right? And again, I mean, the utility not in a strictly non-epistemic way. It can be. Oh no, of course, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you know, I, exactly. That's very. And utility is cool because it has both of those senses, yes, exactly. right? That's why it's that's why that's a that's why that's a great word in that in that context. Um, yeah, that's a really. I'm gonna go sit very quietly and think very hard about that. That's a really cool proposal. That may be exactly right. Um, now that still doesn't I mean again. We're still having we, we, we still run into the question about about uh, what exactly it is that that property uh, applies to. Yeah. Um, but that said, that I don't like way, theorizing rather than theories. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that and I mean, or, or practices, something like that. Uh, theorizing practices, scientific practices. Yeah. But also, and I was going to say, it, it seems that does that also seems like something that at least could theoretically apply uh, two explanations as well, yes, which could yes, get yes, me yes, back yes. toward back toward where I started. Um, which is a scientific practice, explanation. right? Yeah, of course, of course, yes. Um, but that that actually could that could be a way to to sort of integrate. And actually, what's lovely about that is, you know. 
What's the other nice thing about how to put this? That could, it, it, it could be a virtue that could inhere in anything for which the relationship provides makes sense. Right? Which is to say, sometimes you could, you could justifiably and legitimately talk about it in, as, a, as a theory property. Because theories provide answers to questions, but explanations also provide answers to questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, certain other kinds of practices also plausibly provide. Then are you not running the risk of ending in the same boat, like what is understanding? People write books about understanding and it's also, yeah, I mean... Yeah, although I guess... I guess the contrast is important here. Yeah, although I, I guess I'm willing to say that, that, that I'm willing to fall back on the scientific community as the arbiter for what it means to provide an answer to a question. That doesn't necessarily bug me. I mean, maybe I just maybe I'm just too maybe I've got I've read too much von Frossen on explanation. But like I'm 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 kind of I think I'm kind of okay saying, you know, is is that a good answer to that question in that context? Is a, is just that's just that's just for the scientific community to decide. And so providing more providing answers to more useful to more and more useful questions could just be a the scientific community can evaluate whether that's the case or not in a given kind of context. Philosophers can too, but by understanding the criteria and used by the scientists. I'd be okay with that, I think. But I need to and think that's, I want to think about intersecting that idea with both Christian and Max's worries and, and see if that is a way to answer those worries that we had from before or not. If it is, if it is, you may have just done me a real favor. <laughs> I will owe you several beverages. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you can live with that. <laughs> <laughs> I had another question, but uh, maybe some people want to. Maybe it's related to this. So, with whom I am fighting this? Can you imagine some philosopher mm. thinking that Morris is not important? No. Some scientists say, no. no, I prefer narrow theory. No. I prefer narrow theory. I see that Morris is not a scientific virtue. It's not a and that we should go now. No, I don't, I don't have an opponent here, which is kind of fun. I, actually, I legitimately think that, what, that the point of this is there's a cool way to understand a kind of repeating pattern of, of the way that life scientists especially have been constructing their theories and explanations recently that isn't really captured by any of the ways that philosophers of science talk about what's going on right now. It really is that simple. It's like there's something cool happening here. We don't really have a way to talk about it yet that I'm aware of, it deserves a word because I think if we give it a turn, you can find cool commonalities between things like, you know, Darwin's Orchid book and the brain for the human brain project. Actually start to, you know, you start to see weird commonalities between those things that you didn't see before. So it really is, it really is that kind of a, it's a, it is a, it is a kind of, I guess my opponent would say the, the pure opponent would say something like, there's actually not enough in common to really tie these things together. You're seeing kind of phantoms of, of like resemblance between practices that should be kept distinct, that are really just too separate. Uh, sorry, you know, good, nice try, but there's no commonality here. There's no story to tell. Okay. So that's two levels. So your construction, you, your, your view, understand your price as a, as a valid concept for okay. And the other, the other is, uh, let's admit that it's scientific virtue, right? It's, it's something like a, of a value shared by some science. So, right, the scientific community, but we know that those values, as I was saying, are not shared by everyone in the community. And that some scientists are more than more than the other some values, some other values. Um, so, you say that maybe it's a value for the life sciences and not in physics, it's like not applied to physics or to other, other disciplines. So, would everyone in life sciences? In no, I don't. I don't even want to. I don't even want to go that far. But I do think that there is. I do think what I do want to say is that this. This is the. If, if, if in terms of in terms of uh, where I want to go for the payoff with the book, at least. I do want to say if you go look at how, especially right now, contemporary biologists frame for themselves what are the challenges that we're going to have to deal with in the next 50 years of biology. I think you find that a ridiculously large amount of that kind of discussion as it goes on 
makes a lot of sense in a breadth kind of framework. Um, and, I, and this kind of framework lets you see some of this sort of interplay between, between epistemic and non-epistemic value judgments, see the motivation for some of these kinds of choices about what are we going to work on next, where do we want to push the frontiers of biological theory. And so I think, you, I think that's what you get. I think the payoff is, is kind of, there's a way of talking about the future of the life sciences in particular that I've been, this is again, this may, there may be other examples, but that I think really resonates with this way of, this way of understanding what these people, what, 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 the, what the scientists involved are up to, that at least I think you hear less of in, in, other, in other sciences. For one thing, I mean, just to, just to give one concrete example, um, I will not give a name here, this, this anecdote should remain anonymous, but I once heard a director of a, or not a, a very high up of a major uh, U.S. national funding organization uh, tell the anecdote, and I think it was something like breadth that he had in mind, although here it was a liability. So he was telling the following anecdote. He was saying, you know, look, I go to meetings that you guys don't go to. I go to meetings not where we talk about six-digit or seven-digit project grants. I go to the meetings where we talk about eight-digit and nine-digit initiative grants, right? Hundreds of millions national-level initiatives. And the physicists can come into those meetings and go to the chalkboard or put on a PowerPoint and tell us a beautiful story about here's the fundamental theory of how the universe works, except that we don't know the answer to X, and if you give me $800 million, I'm gonna answer it. And like, here's the exact node of the network, right? Here's, the, here's everything we know, and we don't know that, and we're gonna go get it. And all the directors in the room are like, hell yeah, that sounds awesome, wow, that's great, good stuff. And the biologists come in and they go, what a sequence the human genome, and they're like, why? And they're like, we don't know yet. It'll be great though, personalized medicine. And it's like, wait a minute, what, you know, what, what's, what's, what's going on? And I think, I think part of the, I think part of the, the, part of what's at issue there is that a lot of these goals, the way that, the way that these, the way that the life scientists are thinking about their future goals, you know, that's not about how to put it, uh, perhaps most provocatively, you know, we're going to sequence the whole human genome because it's going to give us personalized medicine is sort of trying to bring too much theory when really what they mean to be making is a breadth or they need to be making a non-epistemic value argument. They need to be making some other different kind of argument, but they don't make it. They try to make epistemic value based arguments when that's not really their motivation for doing what they want to be doing in the first place. So if we kind of rethink when they talk this way in terms of like really what they're gunning for is something more like breadth. I think it helps us understand how they're engaging with the future of their own field. Um, and so that's the payoff. I think, I think it's just, I, I, it really is, it's, it's, it's useful lens more than anything else. And maybe in the end, you know, maybe in the end I'm the only guy on the planet who thinks it's a useful lens. And I'll take that. I'll take the L and go home. Um, but but, but, I, but I, I hope not. I, I, I hope that other people would find other reasons that it would be a fun way to think about what people are. So I have the impression that your concept of breadth is maybe even temporal, that there is a temporal aspect to it. Ooh. And so maybe it's because the world itself is more like uh, physical, like uh, there is a uh, étendue. Yeah. So maybe you could try to find a concept, a world in English that have a relation to the future or uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like the temporal aspect is more, seems even the more really, The really cocky thing to do would be to call it promise. Yeah, but I don't think I have the guts. Thing, That's I mean, too weird. That's too, like, hand-wavy and vague. The translation of the word in French is important. So, I mean, right. is it relevant or I mean, I wish, I was about to say, I wish, I wish that, uh, I wish that importance in English had that sense that it does in French of like weight too. Like that's you know, but we don't. That that sense is totally gone in English. I think promise weight. makes weight. Weight? Yeah. I mean, we want to we want to answer weighty weighty questions and not light questions. I mean, yeah. That's maybe there's something there. Yeah. I mean, 
promise would be a, like I said, promise would be probably too cocky. Um, I don't know, I feel like it's maybe more maybe precise. It's, but maybe it's sort of what I have in mind. Because I thought there's huh. also an uncertain, uncertainty aspect to it. Like right. We won't right, that, that part of the problem is, yeah, that, 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 that like, for instance, by contrast with, with fruitfulness, where you want fruitfulness to be a, a bet. Fruitfulness is a bet, and you want your bet to be a good bet. Yeah, yeah. Promise can be a bad bet. Uh, maybe you just renamed my book. I don't know. I gotta think about Sorry. this. That's okay. That's okay. They, they don't care. Once you sign the contract, you can do whatever you want. I'm just <laughs> Look, I think the contract already. I can write whatever the heck I want to write. Uh, it just has to make it past peer review. Uh, okay, I'm going through my Chindler's list. <laughs> so um, a lot of things have been covered yet already. Maybe it could be uh, fruitful uh, to your theory to also get into the scope. Uh, here are two words I understand. Uh, like non straightforward sciences like psychology, economy, economy, social science, because it can be, I think, interesting if you could flesh this concept of breadth out with respect to these science. I think it might be an interesting exercise. Um, That's a really you good idea. Per se have to answer this. No, I'm, oh, well, but I'm going to answer this. I think you're right. That's really cool. And, you know. <laughs> That's really cool. I would love to be able to do that. Can I jump? Yes. I have a parallel, so I don't know if I'm mistaken. If you take commission, for instance, instead of life sciences, you get commission instead. Community science. Uh huh. Okay, so we have this uh, story of community science where. In the, at the beginning, cognitive science is all about cognitivism. The very, very narrow cognitivism, uh, hardcore f functionalism. Um, and uh, <coughs> so we, we, we have the first phase kind of cognitive science starting with this kind of theory. And then we have a lot of people say, well, this is too much, this is too narrow. The computer, you take the, you take the cognition as, as an abstract function of the brain or, or the computer. And then maybe we should get into more. Depths, which we go into depths, that is, we should go maybe into neural mechanisms, something like that. So you evolve into cognitive neuroscience. So that would be kind of extension of, uh, of depths. Then you have also people extending the scope of cognitive science, saying that well, we should do cognitive science of, every, of everything. We should have cognitive science, cognitive science not only for, 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 for psychology of, of, for regular, not only for regular psychology, but we can do, we can apply this to social, to social things, we can do. Uh, so we can be relational psychology, we can do, we can do, we can apply, uh, we can apply cognitive science, we can, we can replace sociology by cognitive science. So this would be an extension of the scope of cognitive science, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, in terms of objects that cognitive science can explain. Uh -huh. And then you have this debate about um, externalism or external cognition, when you say, well, <coughs> maybe cognition is not only uh, kind of uh, things that happen in the brain, uh, maybe we should extend, maybe we should take into account uh, 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 maybe we should take into account uh, other like material phenomena, uh, yeah. external part of cognition, you know, like uh, this kind of uh, notebooks, uh, auto notebook, and so on. Um, so would that be, and that would that be in your perspective? Would that be an extension of the breadth Ooh. of a cognitive explanation? And that could not be very simple to scope or to this uh, yeah. or to prediction and yeah. mechanisms. Yeah. Because those are discussions. Uh -huh. People discussing the information condition are not uh, discussing the relevance of neural information. Yeah. I would love to say yes, but I would have to think a lot longer about my answer. I want to say yes, though. That sounds like a cool because, yeah, in, in, in some sense, it. I guess I'll put it this way. That example has the same kind of flavor as the examples that first motivated me on the project. That is to say, you can point to something that feels like scope, and then you can point to this other thing that feels also like the only word that you would have to describe it is scope, but it feels different from the thing that you just said was scope. 
You know what I mean? And that's, that's exactly the sort of flavor of these cases in the biosciences that made me think in the first place that maybe there's a new, maybe there's a new, kind, of, uh, a new kind of something happening, a new kind of virtue being pursued here. It was exactly for that, for that same reason, to kind of say, you know, wait a minute, like, we, we can imagine what scope would be, and here's once here's the story about that. So yeah, I mean, I'd be te I really am tempted to say yes, but I, I I'd have to think a lot harder about about whether extended cognition would count. It's a really that's a really cool it's a really cool example though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so. I will assign the last five minutes to Max. I also want to play the this is bread game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, it made me think um, also in the domain of sort of cognitive uh, neuroscience in this case, uh, the phenomena of translation, right? That where you have these laboratories which are sort of embedded in. Uh, in neurology departments where they do actually surgeries with, with uh, humans mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and so there's this translational laboratories where they this sort of uh, um, some of the theories and some of the techniques that they use they, they sort of interchange between the lab and the, the, the clinic yeah and I wonder is this breath good um. This gets to a question that I've, another question that I've asked myself and I'm not yet sure, uh, write this down. This is another, this is another question I've asked myself and I'm not entirely sure what I want my answer to be yet. Um, that is to say, Maybe one thing that this concept could also be useful for, and I'm going to even generalize a little from your example. Stop me if you think I'm doing violence to it, but um, maybe another thing that breath could be useful for is recovering a bit of a good, legitimate sense of a much maligned concept in the philosophy of science, namely the basic applied distinction. Maybe there's a bit of something going on in here where some of the phenomena that we, not all, be, uh, obviously, not, not, not everything that we, that, we, that we used to think was you know, qualified as applied science, but maybe part of the difference between basic and applied, or part of the cases that we might have described as applied science are like exactly this, scientists deciding making a conscious choice to move their theory in the direction of a particular kind of societally relevant problem. Um, and maybe that, you know, that, that, that could be, um, that could be a, a good way to think about some of these translational medicine cases. Yeah, but like, you know, we don't just want to do neuroscience in rats. We want to make the, we want to make a very deliberate choice that we're going to push it in the direction of engagement with clinical populations. Um, maybe some, maybe some things on the, you know, by the time you get, I don't want to get all the way off into the weeds of talking about, you know, the distinction between science and engineering, but at some point, by the time you get way off into engineering, this analysis won't work anymore, but maybe some of the kind of first steps in that direction where people are inclined to, you know, kind of, for one thing, depreciate, right, the value of what the scientists are doing. If you could instead say, well, no, look, it's not that they're, they're not like, they're not like, ceasing to do science and starting to do engineering. They're driving their science in a particular kind of direction for certain kinds of well-motivated reasons. Could be a more enlightening way of, of looking at some of those kinds of border cases. Yeah, that's, that's one that I'm, I'm absolutely on board with. And I, have, I, have not, I haven't thought about translational neuroscience in particular, but that's, those kinds of cases in general are something that's on my radar. I have no idea if I'll have enough space to actually talk about it in the book, but it's on my radar.